For about a minute, let's pull the curtain back on one of the Cold War's most overlooked survival tricks. During the height of nuclear anxiety, engineers, soldiers, and civil defense planners poured enormous effort into figuring out one thing. How to keep an underground shelter dry, stable, and livable long after supply lines and maintenance crews stopped showing up. Concrete could crack, steel could rust, filters could clog, and generators could die. But the element that consistently threatened shelters more than anything else was moisture. Groundwater seeped in, humidity condensed on ceilings, Ventilation systems struggled, and yet buried in field manuals and engineering notebooks is a method so simple that most modern preppers overlook it. It wasn't flashy, it wasn't expensive, and it required no electricity. But it kept countless fallout shelters, forward command posts, and storage depots dry enough to operate for years. This Cold War hack, still fully relevant today, is the controlled use of passive drainage and vapor buffering layers, an approach so basic that it almost feels too humble to mention. But the people who built the most durable shelters swore by it because it solved a universal underground problem. Water always wins unless you give it a place to go. In an era when thousands were preparing for the unthinkable, this small piece of engineering kept shelters from quietly rotting into uselessness. And in the next few minutes, we're going to walk through how it worked, why it worked, how it was used, and how you can apply it in modern off-grid or homestead building without needing a bunker of your own. Cold War engineers learned early that a shelter fails from the ground up. The United States, the USSR, and several European nations discovered that even perfectly poured concrete walls could not stop moisture infiltration. Underground structures behave like boats turned upside down. The earth around them is constantly pushing water inward. Cold War builders created drainage blankets, essentially thick layers of gravel, sand, lime rock, or even crushed volcanic cinder to surround the outer walls and floor of a shelter. These layers did something critical. They gave water an easier path of travel than the walls themselves. Instead of fighting water, they guided it away. This wasn't theory. NATO command posts in Germany, Soviet communication bunkers in Eastern Europe, and American civil defense shelters in mountain regions all relied on the same principle. Where drainage blankets were installed correctly, mold stayed low, structural cracking slowed, and interior humidity became manageable even with minimal mechanical ventilation. Where they skipped this step, deterioration began almost immediately. The key insight was that moisture can be redirected long before it becomes a problem. One of the more clever techniques buried in Cold War manuals involved combining the drainage blanket with a vapor buffering zone. Builders used wooden planks, stacked stone, or even layers of bitumen impregnated fiberboard to create a micro gap between earth and wall. This layer didn't act as a waterproof membrane. Instead, it acted as a sacrificial region that absorbed moisture, wicked it horizontally, and encouraged evaporation into the gravel layer rather than the interior. This seems subtle, but it mattered. Moisture doesn't just seep through cracks. It travels through microscopic pores in concrete due to vapor pressure. By giving it a zone to equalize and dissipate, builders prevented interior surfaces from sweating during hot-cold temperature swings, one of the biggest issues in underground shelters. It's the same principle that allowed Cold War food depots to store paper labels, fabric, and dry rations without them turning soggy 
or mold-stained. The method still works today because physics hasn't changed. Whether you are building a root cellar, a storm shelter, a cold storage room, an off-grid pantry, or simply trying to keep a detached basement dry, the Cold War drainage and buffer system is one of the most reliable, passive moisture controls ever designed. It does not require pumps, power, exotic materials or expensive membranes. It requires only an understanding of how water chooses the easiest path. For a modern homesteader, the simplest application is this. Excavate wider than the structure you're building and backfill with a thick layer of coarse stone or gravel that wraps the walls and floor perimeter. Then add a vapour buffering interior zone, one or two inches of breathable material such as lime-washed wood or mineral-based sheeting, before adding final wall coverings or storage shelving. You can take it a step further by shaping the gravel layer into a downward slope leading to a dry pit, collection sump, or external drain tile. During the Cold War, these were rarely perfect systems, yet even a basic slope reduced groundwater pressure enough to extend the life of a shelter by decades. One of the most practical ways this shows up today is in cold storage construction. Suppose you're building a backyard root cellar. If you follow only modern YouTube tutorials, you'll see many concrete on earth builds that rely solely on plastic liners. The Cold War method says to reverse the approach, don't trap the moisture, guide it. Dig an extra foot or two around the perimeter, lay down a bed of crushed stone six to eight inches deep, Set your walls. Add another stone layer around the exterior before refilling. Then, inside the cellar, install a lime-based plaster or treated wood buffer zone. This small addition reduces the humidity spikes that ruin stored vegetables, jars and tools. The same applies to a modern storm shelter. Builders often assume that reinforcing steel and waterproof paint is enough. But Cold War engineers would insist on adding a passive drainage layer before pouring backfill. Their shelters remain dry long after maintenance workers stopped visiting because they weren't relying on perfection. They were relying on gravity. The final lesson from this forgotten Cold War hack is that the simplest systems are often the most resilient. Engineers working under secrecy and urgency had to design structures that could survive without power, oversight or replacement parts. What they left behind is a blueprint for anyone today who wants to build something that lasts, whether it's a homestead cellar, a shed foundation or a small safe room. If you found this guide valuable and you want more deep historical insights with real-world applications, make sure you subscribe to In the Beginning and share this video with fellow history buffs and survival-minded friends. The old world still has lessons worth preserving, and together we keep them alive.